the way I like to do things is, is not to dogmatize anybody. You know what I mean by that? No? I don't say okay. To dogmatize means you don't think about it, you don't study it, you just hear what I say. I'm the authority on it, and you just accept that. Okay? Does that make sense? You ever, you ever experience that in, in it, maybe in a church or maybe in an educational setting or, or somewhere else? Okay? So what ends up happening is whatever the pastor's view is on this thing, then that's the one that the church needs to adopt. And this is not one of the... There are some things that I, that I hold dearly that I think those are, those are core beliefs that every believer needs to believe, and I, and I need to be really straight on on those, okay? But then there's a lot of things that I think there's, there's latitude, there's, there's, there's some liberty there, and they're not core beliefs. But, so I, I come to something like Revelation, and, uh, and I'm aware that we come out of our backgrounds. I'm, I'm aware that we might have, have heard things somewhere along the way, and, uh, and probably, I think I opened up with this, probably most of us, whatever, and not everybody, I, I know this won't be everybody, but probably a lot of us believe what we believe about the end times because that's what we were taught, you know, in church. At least that's the way it was for me, okay? And, uh, and so what I like to do is I like to get behind the stuff, I like to go, how did we come to these views, you know? And I like to help people come to the conclusion for themselves from God's word and not believe it because that's what I'm saying in, a, in, a, in an authoritative kind of way. Does that make sense? Okay. I, am I losing y'all? Because I see a lot of people looking down and I, I've, I'm not sure I'm connecting. Okay, okay, yes. Yeah, to, to search the scriptures to see if the things that, that he was teaching was, was true. Um, yes, and, and, and you do, but I want you to, and that is absolutely true, so I'm not going to ask, raise, raise the hands, how many people the last couple of weeks have been studying themselves along the way? I'm not going to do that. I hope that you have. I hope that there's something that stimulated a deeper desire to get into revelation or related uh, scriptures and stuff, but what I want to do is I want you to believe it not because I give you my take on something, but I what I want to do is is you know you know what revel, revelation is supposed to be an unveiling, right? That's what I want to do. I want to unveil some things so you can look and go, oh okay, now that piece goes here and that piece of the puzzle. Um, so. Um, I just, I just wanted to say that to you because I know that next week we're going to finish, but we're not going to finish. And I look at this as a first stab at something that, that I do value, that I think is important, uh, but there will need to be another time to go into more of that in the in the future, and I don't know when or where or how what that's going to look like. But having said that, uh, I wanted you to know my approach, and that and the, again that my approach is is not to dogmatize you, but to help you, you know, maybe see some things you might not have seen before in in a certain light, and and then. And then you have to wrestle with it for yourselves in Scripture. Um, <clears throat> okay? Amen. Amen? We good? So I, I have way more material, if I want to call it material, way more that we could go in. We can't even get into Daniel, okay, or the Old Testament prophets with the time that we have. In fact, even today... I'm going, to, I'm going to pull out of, mostly out of Revelation, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some of the New Testament background 
for it, okay? Which was some, some places that, that uh, if, if any of you have studied end time type stuff, you've been there, okay? So, all right, we good? All right, so here's the first thing that I, I want to draw for you. So, I want you to think about this. We got Genesis over here. We got Revelation down here. In many respects, it's interesting how Revelation is the last book in our Bibles, right? Uh, and the reason that's for that is a lot of stuff that got started here is ending here with a look at a new start. So all of our Bible from here to here has been unveiling the consequences of what happened here. It's it's, uh, progress and digress, and progress again and digress, and then finally we're coming to this place where things are wrapping up and ending And the end is not a permanent end, but it's ending what life as we know it and starting all things new. Um, That's the the thing that we find at at the end of the book of Revelation. He says, I make all things new. So if we were to, so we got this whole, this whole history here. Okay. But if we were to enlarge Revelation now, this is what it would look like. So we've got Revelation 1 through 3, and we got over here, we've got Revelation um, 20, we'll, we'll say 21 through 22. You could debate whether you put 20 in here or not. And then between these, We'll come to that in a minute. What happens in Revelation 1 through 3? Okay, yeah. But first, chapter 1 is what? John has a revelation of who? Jesus, okay. Walking amongst seven lampstands and all that kind of stuff, okay? So you have a revelation, and in the revelation, what does Jesus say to John? I want you to write down the revelation I'm about to give you, and you're going to give it to who? The, yes. How many churches do we have in chapter 2 and 3? Seven churches. I, I, next week I'm going to get into the, the number of seven, the number of sevens that are in here. We'll, we'll look at, do a little numerology. But So, now, it's interesting he's saying, who, who's the audience? Who is he writing to? The church, a historical, local church of the time, okay? Now, what is Revelation 21 through 22? Yes, it's God is going to make all things new. He's going to create a new heavens and new earth. It is a new Garden of Eden, but it's a Garden of Eden that has moved from a, from a garden to a city. So it's also a new what? Jerusalem. Okay. So, so this ends all of this, and now we're going to start something new, and this is the new. All all of this right here, this parentheses right here, that's where all the debate is. That's where all the, huh? (laughs) What's going on in the end times? That's all this part in Revelation. Tell me again what happens in 4 through 5. It's a throne room scene, isn't it? Okay, 24 elders, four living creatures, myriads of angels, um, all of that is going on there. 
and they're all, they're all looking around, and they're going, uh, we see a lamb over there by, the, by God. And, and between the four living creatures, and this lamb looks slain, but alive, but, but bloody. The lamb comes out, and then the next thing you know, the scene shifts over, and there's, there's a scroll that can't be opened, has seven seals. And they're like, who can open this? The lamb can open it. So the lamb opens the seven seals. Then the seven seals, uh, at, at the end of, of the seven seals, the seventh seal is actually the beginning of the seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet is actually the, the, the opening of the seven bowls of judgment. Which means there probably are different perspectives on the same events. Okay? But that we'll pick back up on that next week. So that all, that all ends after all of that. Everybody's kind of debating what are the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. Looks like a bunch of hard stuff coming down, doesn't it? Like, so it's called... Tribulation. Now, is there anything that puts a the in front of it? The tribulation. Or is it just tribulation? The New Testament era is full. You can't hardly open up your New Testament letters and not read about tribulation. Suffering, going through hardships, wars, all this kind of stuff, there was tribulation. Is there something called the tribulation, or is it just tribulation? i just leave that for you to think about, okay? But that's what's going on here. And then finally, so then finally, towards the end of this, around chapter 17, is what? Okay, close. Yeah, we're uh, around the, uh, so, yes, well, let me. Depending on how you look at it, it's always depending on how you look. So 17 through 20, we'll just say, is the fall of what? Babylon. Okay, fall of Babylon, the reign of Christ now, judgment. Okay, the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, all of that. And, and a discussion of a thousand year reign. All of these things are right in here. But all of this stuff gets reconfigured according to your view of some of these things. So, you know, I talked to you two weeks ago. I talked about the preterist view. What is the preterist view? Yeah, believes that most of all of this, not, not every part of it, but most of it happened early on, right after, right after Revelation was given. The, um, the futurist view puts it where? Sinks all that up to, the, to right before Christ comes back, well, usually about seven years before he comes back, right? And that tribulation that comes in those seven years is is sometimes called the tribulation. The second half of that tribulation is called the great tribulation because it just got intensified. Okay? So tribulation is what the is what the ungodly bring upon the godly. Wrath is what God brings upon the ungodly. And so you have both tribulation and wrath mixed in here. Does that make sense? Okay? All right. So all of this is, is going on. And so then you've got, you've got, a, you've got an idealist view that says, I, I see this happening uh, spiritually all the time. Okay, And then you had that historicist view. So I don't want to rehash all of that, but I just want that back into our minds because it's been two weeks since we've been there. Now, I want us to turn to 1 Peter. Actually, 2 Peter. We'll go to 2 Peter. I will tell you for the sake of time that 1 Peter, one of the things that 
in Peter's letter, Peter has two, two letters attributed to him, First and Second Peter, right, in, in our New Testaments. They're short letters. In First Peter, most scholars will tell you that Peter was writing and trying to tell everybody, be ready, get ready, I'm coming back. That's, that's a theme that you'll see throughout the letter. Okay, get ready, I'm coming back. In the fact, uh, uh, chapter 4 um, says, the end, in chap- verse 7 says, the end of all things is at hand, therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. And he, and he tells all these things. But the end of all things is at hand. What do you think of if somebody comes up to you and says, okay, The year is at hand, or this thing's at hand, or this thing is near. What are you thinking? Uh, Hundreds of years away? No, you're you're thinking, okay, let's get ready. He's coming back. All right. Now, 2 Peter is an answer to why Jesus has not come back. Turn to chapter 3. We're going to read through this, and we'll pause at a few, a few places, okay? 2 Peter chapter 3. This is now, beloved, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you. Ah, the second letter, okay. In which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. I want to remind you of some things that I've told you in the past I'm stirring you back up. That you should remember the words spoken before him by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. So the apostles affirmed what the prophets were saying in the Old Testament. All right? What might that be? Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking following after their own lust. They're going to mock you, saying, verse 4, where's the promise of his coming? Now look at me. Don't read on. Look at me for a second. I know you want to read on. It's It's tempting. There's even good temptation, isn't there? That's a good temptation. Read on. Read more. Okay? But But just stop and think about it for a minute. In the last days, there will be mockers. You hear any of those today? Where... Where's his coming? He ain't coming back. You guys have been waiting for 2,000 years. When they got this, they had been waiting for two years since the first letter that he wrote to them, telling them his return. He doesn't use the word imminent, but it's near. It's soon. It could happen pretty soon. And now he's saying, hey, don't worry about the mockers. Don't worry about those who... And he gives them an answer for why they shouldn't. Ah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to call you out over there, Michael. You're reading ahead. Man. Michael's a, Michael is a student of the Word. I, I love this guy. I appreciate him. So we, we'll give you special grace. You read on. Okay. All right. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> so here it is, verse 4, saying, Where's the promise of his coming? These are what the mockers say. Then, Peter goes on to say, For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues. Wait, excuse me. Uh, That's not Peter speaking. That's still the mocker. For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Back here, creation started back here. It's noted in Genesis, right? We got the beginning of all things. And these mockers are saying, hey, all the, all the fathers, who were the fathers? You, you could say it was Moses. You could say it was Abraham, Isaac. Jay, all of them are fathers. You could, you could bring it up to the early church fathers maybe, except they wouldn't have been in the mindset here when he wrote this. But here it is. For ever since the fathers fell asleep, in other words, they died. That's a euphemism for dying. All continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. So, 
You're wasting your time worrying about him coming back again. He's not coming back. That's the point. Verse 5, for, but now it says this, for when they maintain this, when that's their argument, when that's their point, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, now listen, look at me, look at me. Ah, you're reading. Ah! Now look at me. If you read, you don't get to stop and hear little points that I want to say to you along the way. So, so here it is. Peter is, what he's doing here is he's like, okay, I'll bite. I'll take your argument all the way back to creation. You're saying, ah, all's just remaining the same. Hey, listen, if you're going to maintain that argument, let me tell you something. It's escaping your notice that it was by the word of God, this word that, that we're going back to. It was by the word of God that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed being flooded with water. Now, now listen what he's, what he's done here. He's gone back here and Peter is saying back here that the world, the world started with water. Now, uh, I... Dr. Ball is here with us, and he can confirm or, or, or not. But I, I have heard it said before. First of all, you go back to Genesis 1, and it does say this. It says that, that water covered the surface of the earth. You know, it was, like a, it was just like a... I almost think it's like you shoot water out into space, and it, because of the gravity, it's going, boom, it's going to make kind of a little sphere, kind of boom, 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 out there, you know. And it says the Spirit was hovering over the surface of the waters, and then, then God calls forth and land forms and all these things. But, so we begin with water, H2O. Now, you can tell me, I've just heard years ago, and I'm, I'm not a chemist, but I heard one time that, that the, the elementary table that you have to begin with hydrogen and oxygen somehow to create more. Does that, any of that relate to anything that you know of that I'm missing? <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yeah, with hydrogen. So it's just interesting. Um, I'm not trying to make the Bible a science book. I just, I just find that fascinating, though, that he is acknowledging here that the that God started, let's get back in here, okay, all right, and it says that the heavens existed long ago, and that, that the earth was formed out of water and by water, okay, now God fashions however he does it, he fashions and makes an earth and puts people on it and all that stuff, but then he says this, He says that the world at that time was destroyed. Wait a second. Didn't you mockers say that everything's just continued on? Hey, he's already bringing our attention back to a historic moment of judgment. The world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. So it was, it was made by water, out of water, and then it was destroyed by water. But the present heavens, verse 7, but the present heavens and the earth by his word, are being reserved for fire. Remember, he gave us a, 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 a promise, you know, a rainbow, that he will never destroy the earth again by water. And we go, wow, thank you, God, that we're, never, we're never going through that again. Oh, but he didn't promise that he wouldn't destroy it in another way, right? Just won't do it by water. Because now he's, he, Peter is saying... The present heavens and earth by his word are being reserved for what? Fire. Kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Which may include some mockers if we can't get them saved. Verse 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. We're not going to talk about all that. Verse 9. The Lord is not 
slow about his promise. Okay, don't read on. Just, just let that just let that set for a minute. The Lord is not slow about his promise. I told you in the letter I sent you two years ago that he's coming. It's at hand. The end is at hand. But now you hear all these mockers saying, no. All is as it was from the beginning of creation. Are you sure you want to stand on that? And he comes along here and he says, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. <laughs> That's his reason for a thousand years. Can God's not, you know, time that doesn't impact God the way it does to us. Okay? The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient. Ooh. If, if we can just stop and go, the long-suffering and patience of our God is incredible to me. How patient does God have to be to put up with what he has put up with over and over and over again? Why would he even be patient? I'm done. I've had it with this. This world is horrible. I'm going to end it now, but no. He's patient. Why is he patient towards you? Because he's not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Doesn't say in the night here. The day of the Lord will come. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. The heavens and the earth that we live on. Everybody do this. That firm foundation, that earth beneath your feet. <gasps> Take a breath of that atmosphere that, well, I guess it blocks. It, air is not going to get out of our uh, that upper layer up there, but... But the heavens that we look into in the night sky, all of that, look what's going to happen. Verse 11. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, in other words, burned up, what sort of people ought you to be in? He just um, goes and he, he's asking you a question, but he goes ahead and tells you the answer. What sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? If we know this is what's coming... Verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. You know, that's pretty, that sounds, man. But then, verse 13, but according to his promise, a new promise, not the promise of a rainbow, According to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Okay, could I look at me for just a moment? I want you to picture all that he has said. Because this is relevant back into the book of Revelation. He is saying the current heavens and earth that we live on are going to be melted down and God's going to recreate he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth I, I don't know if he'll replace the stars in different places I don't know how all that will work but, but the, a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells now what does that tell us about if you go read Revelation 21 and 22 later today you will find that what Peter tells us corresponds with what John is telling us from this revelation. They're very consistent endings, okay? New heavens and a new earth. Now, what does that tell you? First of all, heaven that we often think of is not up there or out there and, you know, when we die, we immediately go to 
that heaven. We, we go to a place, I, I, I believe, called paradise or Abraham's bosom. And that's the waiting place. But Jesus is there. But when all is said and done, we're, we're not wisp up into heaven. We're coming right back here. This is where he started. He started God's original plan was, was that God would dwell with, with humanity created in his image. We're his image bearers, right? And we're going to do that with him on earth. The garden becomes a city. Okay? Now, um, it's just crazy. I, uh, I was going to go to First, Thir- First Thessalonians um, and then Matthew, but we don't really have time. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right here. This is, uh, this is just the way it works, I guess. So I want to, is there a question? I'm going to take a moment for a couple of questions, if we have any. Okay, if we don't, then um, I'm going to try to squeeze in just a little of Thessalonians. No, I'm not. I'm going to, I'm going to, huh? Squeeze, squeeze. Um, ah. Let's go to Matthew 24. All we really learned about what Peter had to say was there's a reason for God's what appears like delay to us and it's patience. And we learned that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth the same way John. Peter didn't tell us anything about this. Okay? What I want you to see is Matthew 24. Um... You'll be familiar with this. When, when I say Matthew 24, how many j- immediately go, oh, yeah, I know what's going on there? Okay, yeah. All right. Well, let's look at it. Uh, verse 1, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up, came to uh, point out the temple buildings to him. And if you read this in Mark, uh, they, they go, oh, aren't these wonderful buildings? You know, and so Mark adds a little bit. And... Uh, And so, then he answered and said to them, do you not see all these things? Yeah, the buildings you think are so beautiful and so wonderful. Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. You mean the buildings and the temple itself, the temple that that our forefathers built a second time, these are going to be destroyed? You know, and they, so they, they go, they're sitting around Mount Olive, and the disciples ask him privately, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Sounds like three questions, it's really two. What will be the sign of your coming, and what will be the end of the age? So, uh, well, and you could say, when, when is this temple going to be destroyed, Right? Right? Yeah, okay. So verse 4 says this, Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. There was always a concern. In Peter, what was the concern? Don't listen to the mockers. Here, make sure that no one misleads you. Right? Make sure that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars, seeing that you are not frightened. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Oh, and then look at this verse. Then they will deliver you to tribulation. And will kill you, 
and you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. Now, does it sound like he's talking about, I'm, I, I'm leading you, but I'm not telling you this is necessarily what to believe, but I'm, I'm, I'm just asking you these little questions. When he says, uh, he's talking to them, uh, he's answering their questions when these things happen, does it sound like this is a long ways off? Or does it sound like he's talking, that, hey, guys, I, I want you to be aware. Don't let anybody mislead you. Okay? It, 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 it sounds to me like it, the expectation is soon, kind of the same way you have with Peter. All right? <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, then they will deliver you to tribulation. Verse 10, and at that time many will fall away and will deliver up one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. And because lawlessness is increased, many people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. And endures to the end of what? Just in, you know, our life or endures this tribulation, the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. Ah, does that extend it out then? Because the gospel has to go everywhere to every nation before the end shall come. Verse 15, here's a key thing. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on his housetop not go down to get the things that are in his house. And let him who is in the field not turn back to get, the, get his cloak. And woe to those who are with child and those who nurse babes in those days. But pray that your flight may not be in winter... Or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. Now, now if you read this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip there to Luke because Luke tells this same thing that Jesus is, is sharing. But uh, Luke 21, verse 20. And he makes it even clearer. Look at this, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is at hand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in the midst of the city depart, and let not those who are in the country enter the city, because these are, uh, are days of vengeance, in order that all things which are written may be fulfilled." Woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babes in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. What are we talking about here? It really, if you know a little history, all of this looks very much like what happened in the what would be called the, the Jewish-Roman uh, War that started somewhere around 66 A.D. And, and uh, basically... Uh, uh, the, the Jewish army went in to rush and take over and, 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 and protect their, their place. And, um, and at the time, Nero was emperor when this happened. Now, he died before 70 A.D., a couple of years before 70 A.D. But Titus, who was a warrior at that time, who later became an emperor about 10 years later, he comes in and he fights with them, and eventually he goes in and defeats the Jews, 
takes over Jerusalem and goes in and destroys the temple. This is now the second time the temple's been destroyed. You know, Solomon built the temple first, and then it got destroyed by the Babel, Babylonians, Babylon. Ah, we're always like Babylon, okay? And they went into exile. They came out, rebuilt the temple. Now we've had this second temple all along. And if you didn't have the book of Revelation, and all you had was this, and what would you be thinking? Wow, what's he talking about? Does... The temple is down. We go back to, we go back to verse 24. Um, the temple building. They're all admiring the temple building. And Jesus says, not one stone will be left. It will be torn down. I'm just saying that, man, this, this, uh, this looks... Um, <laughs> this looks like a fulfillment... Now, here's the interesting thing. There was, um, after the second temple was rebuilt, Daniel, you go back to the prophet Daniel, uh, three or four times in, the, in, in his letter, um, or his prophetic book, uh, he warns of a, an abomination of desolation. That what, what's go, there's going to be an abomination that takes place in the temple. Now, uh, he prophesies this, and I don't know, a hundred and something years later, uh, you end up finding a, uh, um, one of the um, uh, rulers of the, of the day. Uh, it, w- it was in a time when Greece was powerful, and a, a man named Antiochus Epiphanes, an epiphany. What's an epiphany? A, a God shining. You know, he named himself that, by the way. Okay, his name, his name was Antiochus, but, but Epiphanes, he called him that because he said, I am God manifest. And he's the guy that leads the destruction of the temple, goes in and, well, actually, he doesn't destroy it, excuse me. He goes in, and what he does is he desecrates it, an abomination. He he uh, sacrifices a pig in the temple now, and he forced Jews to eat pork. Now, all of this was what? Unkosher, right? All of this was a, a desolation. But most scholars don't think that this was, this was a complete fulfillment. And you have Jesus saying, do we not? Verse 15 of chapter 24. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee. He was actually saying, when this army comes in, you want to flee to the mountains. You want to hide. Hopefully it won't be winter. Hopefully it's not a Sabbath when everybody's there and they can just kill you all at once. All of those sorts of things. So there is something prophesied here, but then he says... He brings up Daniel's uh, abomination of desolation. Is it possible that that was fulfilled in what Titus did? Titus was the, the general of the army that later became an emperor there. Is that what he did when he came in there and ultimately destroyed the temple, killed over a million Jews... Uh, and, and so, what is that? Sounds like a lot of tribulation, doesn't it? It could fit. However, there are some challenges to that. Because one, and unless I can be shown otherwise, uh, I'm of the school of thought that, that um, the book of Revelation was written probably in the mid-90s A.D., 93, 94, 95 A.D., whereas 70 A.D. is when this happened. And there are those who believe, preterists believe, that, that this was, uh, uh, that Revelation was written in the mid-60s. And it could be. Uh, but I, I have to bring these things to our attention. 
so that we can kind of see where that goes. Now, let's, let's come back. Let's come back to... Uh, Where did I stop before? Uh, Matthew 24, 27. We'll, we'll pick up right there. Oh, no, verse 22. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days shall be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Now, I will tell you, even that fits that era. There were false Christs everywhere. False prophets, false apostles, false everything in the first century of the church. Okay? But it, it could fit a lot of seasons, and it could fit the future. If therefore you do not, if therefore they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go forth, or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. Verse 27 For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Whether the corpse is there, the vultures will get, where the corpse is there, the vultures will, will gather. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky of the power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Now, you start reading that, that doesn't sound like 70 AD. Did Jesus come on the clouds? Was he there? Did he call forth his elect at that time? The destruction of the temple, all of everything of that is fitting. So, so you, I, I'm just bringing these things to your attention. You and I will have to wrestle with these, because when the Son of Man does come with great power, so and 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 maybe maybe all he is saying, he's asked two questions, right? Let's go back to twenty-four. He's asked two questions. I say to you, uh, excuse me, what are where are the questions? Oh, tell us when these things will be. In other words, when's the temple going to be destroyed, and what's the sign of your coming? Maybe those are not the same. Okay, we can read the book of Revelation and see that not everything is fulfilled, da, 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 you know, all at, at one time. Uh, so, it's now he's focused, it seems like the first part he's focused about tribulation, he's focused on, on, on what's going to happen in Jerusalem maybe, or at least what's going to happen with the temple, but now he, he seems to be talking about, I'm coming back. I'm coming back for my, my church, my people. And when that happens, there will be a, a great trumpet. Well, that, that kind of corresponds back into here. We, we see some trumpets. You see it in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, but there needs to be some collating of these things. Then he tells a parable of a fig tree. Um, and he says, when you see... Verse 32, now learn the parable from the fig tree when, and its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, then you know summer's near. Okay. Yeah, we see that. We see that right now, don't we? You go outside and you'll see some of the branches are starting to put forth little leaves, little foliage, and we're going, ah, spring's here. We hope it lasts a long time, but it looks like summer's on the way. So then you too, when you see all these things, the temple... Uh, maybe what he is saying, saying here in the verses that preceded, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Do you think the early church after 70 AD? Now, that was not necessarily Christians, right? It were Jewish people. Christianity was spreading all over the place, but Christians, like Jews, were being persecuted heavily during that time. 
Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. What generation? The generation that, the generation that, uh, that was there when Jesus said this, or the generation that sees these signs? Okay. Um, oh, I wish I could go to second, but we can't. I'm going to end on this. Verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son. Isn't that interesting? I think that's in Acts chapter 1, too. The Son does not know. The fa- only the Father alone knows the the day and the hour. That's interesting when you start thinking about the Trinity, isn't it? Verse 37. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Oh, it kind of ties in with Peter here a little bit. Listen to this. Uh, for in those days, uh, which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came. And I'm going to say this with me. Took them all away. Say it. Took them all away. Took them all away. So shall the coming, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. It will come when we're not expecting it. Even though we see the signs, we should know that it is near. And we should be ready. How are we to live godly, holy lives, knowing how this is all going to, how, how it's going to end? But, I want you to see something here. Then there shall be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you too be ready too, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. How many, and we'll we'll end on this last thing to ponder, okay? How many of you ever read one of the Left Behind books? Okay, yeah, my kids. I found stacks of them the other day because they they all read through them. Um, And so what often is common here is to read this and say, Aha, here's the rapture. Then there shall be two men in the field. One will be taken away and one will be left. And it's like, oh, no. I was left, and I felt that experience. I told you that a couple of weeks ago, didn't I? I, I thought I had been left, and, uh, and that my parents had been taken away, and the people that I knew at church had all been taken away, and, and there I was, you know, left behind. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest something here, and I'm not against people who hold this view, okay? Because I think any view you take... Uh, we're, we're all looking for this. <laughs> Whatever this shapes out, I want to live a godly life. I want to know that tribulation hap- you know, is, is a part of life and all those things. And I, whether, whether most of this was up here or most of it's back down here or it's scattered throughout, however you see it. But I'm going to make points for you to consider, okay? That's, that's my goal here. Not to dogmatize you, just to bring you maybe new ways to, to look at it. I, there's only one passage in Scripture that even is overt in expressing something as a rapture, and that's in, in Thessalonians. Okay? Um, the only place that you might think that you see it is in Revelation 4 because John gets swept away by the Spirit and he's in the throne room. But it never says that the church 
gets raptured out. There's no de depiction. But if you hold to that view, that's where they see it. So that all this tribulation now is a part of that last seven years. So sometimes this is looked upon as... Then there shall be two men, one in the field, and one will be taken, and one will be left. Sounds like a rapture, the one that's taken. And then there will be two women grinding at the mill. One will be taken, and one will be left. And you go, gosh, we don't want to be left behind. I, I'm going to tell you, what he's saying here, you want to be left, not taken. <laughs> okay. Um, I believe, I humbly believe propose that you consider this okay let's go back to verse 39 of chapter 24 so it's the the preceding verse okay they did not understand until the flood came and took them away took who away the ungodly the ungodly were the ones taken away, swept away by the flood, the judgment. So here, he's using the same uh, uh, grammar, so to speak. Then there shall be two men in the field, and one will be taken away, like in the day of Noah. And one will be left Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken away and one will be left. Uh, therefore, be on the alert for you do not know. Um, so I, I'm just going to let you chew on that. Okay? Uh, it's not original with me. There are many. I'm giving you a lot of stuff that, that also, if you study these things, you'll find that there are a lot of other um, ways to understand some of these things. So, uh, how do I end this today? <laughs> oh, that's so good. That's so good. Um, I just, uh, yeah, with prayer, yeah, we'll end this with prayer. Um, I really wanted to get into some interesting... I, I, I want this backdrop because your mind, our minds constantly, as we're talking about Revelation stuff, our minds are always kind of going, yeah, but what, what was that going in Matthew 24? You know, what is that in Thessalonians? You know, go, go look those things up. Study those things because there's just there's a lot of things that if you've been taught a certain way, that's how you see it. And... I'm kind of picking apart all of our views, mine included. I, I'm not even telling you where I land at this moment in time. It's different than it was last week. No, I'm, I'm teasing. But, but, but I, to me, there's parts of this that are so important that we understand the, the times we live in. I mean, I, uh, wherever you land on this, at the end of the day, uh, you, there's so much of this that ought to speak to how we live, regardless of whether we get this part. Is the church going to be raptured before the tribulation? Is the tribulation is the church going to go through the tribulation and then Jesus comes? Uh, did the tribulation, for the most part, already happen back around the 60s and 70s A.D. and then and then Jesus is coming back, but 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 there will just be kind of a Ongoing tribulation, I, you, I want you to wrestle with that the same way I wrestle with it, and and um, and kind of go, what does that mean for how I live right now? And so there's plenty in here. Um, all right, let's just pray. Yeah, let's just pray. Uh, God, we believe in your, in your word. We believe in this book. And yet, Lord God, there's things that are hard to understand, especially if we have to be so precise. 
I pray that you guide our, our understanding, but I pray that you guide more our hearts, Lord, to know whatever times we're living in, Lord, we do, we do eagerly wait for your return. What lies between there before us, Lord God, we don't fully know, but we know whom we have believed and trust in. And so we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.